It's 2 p.m. outside the U.S. consulate in Guadalajara, Mexico. Enrique Camarina of the Drug Enforcement Administration is taking a break from his top secret investigation to meet his wife for lunch. He's been working long hours lately and hasn't seen much of her or their two children. It's the first time in US history that a DEA agent has been abducted on foreign soil. The agency knows there's only one man who could have pulled off such a brazen act. Someone they've been tracking for nine years. Smoking cocaine, they call it crack. Rock. At the peak of the cocaine trade in 1984, a hundred tons of cocaine are smuggled into the US. Eight million Americans are hooked. It's the best, it really is. A lot of Americans, particularly in the 80s, didn't think of it as major organized crime. They thought of it as a vice. It was all funny. A third of homicides are drug related. It's a war America cannot afford to lose. Crack traffic in our city. The US government throws its resources into battling the Colombian drug cartels responsible for the flood of cocaine. The DEA joined the Colombian police and military on the front line of the drug war. By the mid 1980s, the Colombian cartels have been hit hard. But stepping into the vacuum of power are new adversaries much closer to home. Just across the border in Mexico, the Mexican cartels. This was the mafia. They controlled Jalisco state. They controlled Sinaloa state. States all along the border. And they made inroads into Mexico city. Almost the entire flow of drugs through Mexico into the United States is controlled by a former police officer. El Padrino, the godfather. 39-year-old Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Felix Gallardo is a very high-functioning psychopath. Felix Gallardo grew up in a ranch in Sinaloa, a state in northwest Mexico. Although his family was poor, he always had big ambitions. Miguel Felix Gallardo grew up in the state of Sinaloa, you know, very close to the capital of Culiacan. And he came from a very poor family. He studies business in college and becomes a state police officer in his early 20s. He quickly learns that corruption is endemic throughout the Sinaloan police force. In Mexico, the state and the local police departments are rife with corruption. They're bought and paid for by the drug traffickers. Smart, ambitious, and ruthless, Gallardo climbs the ladder of power and corruption quickly. He soon becomes the bodyguard to the governor of the state of Sinaloa, Leopoldo Sanchez Celis. It was through this governor that he started to meet a lot of very high-ranking politicians and officials that would help protect him in his drug trafficking activities. But Felix Gallardo isn't satisfied with just being on the payroll. Like many other corrupt officials at the time, he wants to make more money. And so he moves into the drug trade himself. 
He uses established marijuana and heroin pipelines into the US to transport Colombian cocaine. But he insists that he gets paid in both cash and cocaine. Some Mexican criminals said, well, OK, you can pass through our country, but you're going to pay us, and you're going to pay us in cocaine as well as money. Felix Gallardo also takes 50% from each shipment of cocaine to sell on himself. And they said, well, we're just going to control this trade ourselves, and we will use the Colombians as suppliers, but we will control the value added. The markup in any retail market is where the profit is. In the mid-1970s, Gallardo is a mid-sized smuggler of drugs, transporting up to two tons of cocaine across the border and turning over millions of dollars every year. But he wants to be the biggest drug lord in Mexico, and that means setting up legitimate businesses to launder money and cover his tracks. He was very cunning. He sat on the board of directors of banks. He owned hotels. He owned ranches. But this is no respectable businessman. Gallardo maintains his growing empire with generous bribes. He was spending in excess of $50 million a year in bribes. And he rules with tactical brutality, annihilating all rivals. He did it very surgically. He knew that wholesale violence would be bad for business, so he tried to avoid that. But he was not above taking lives when he had to. Gallardo has around 1,000 assassins on his books, in Mexico and in the US, from the Midwest to the West Coast. Their job? to eliminate anyone who doesn't pay up or tries to take over his business. These were people who killed whole families. These were people who chopped up their enemies then put their parts in bags and left them places. These were people who tortured, and these were murderers. He bases his operation in Guadalajara, in the state of Jalisco. They call it the Pearl of the West famous for its fantastic climate, university, and art scene. But now it's also home to Mexico's most notorious drug baron. Guadalajara was a nicer place to live. Had more entertainment, better schools. The traffickers had families. Being such bloodthirsty people, you wouldn't think that they had some sort of a normal family life. But they did have families. Soon, Felix Gallardo's drug smuggling operation is making close to $5 billion a year. But Gallardo wants more. So in 1980, he joins forces with two other Mexican kingpins to form the Guadalajara Drug Cartel. The first of them is 32-year-old Rafael Caro Quintero. Rafael Caro Quintero, who was very cold-blooded. Caro Quintero was put in charge of the marijuana plantations. The other partner is 54-year-old Ernesto Fonseca. His nickname was Don Neto, which means, sir, good price. That means bargain guy. Fonseca was given responsibility for the cultivation and trafficking of heroin. That same year, Enrique or Kiki Camarina, a young narcotics agent, is assigned to the DEA's office in Guadalajara. Born in Mexico, Camarina moves to the US as a child and grows up in the border town of Calexico, California. He gets his college degree in criminal justice and joins the Marines. In 1974, he becomes a special agent with the DEA. This is a common pattern. DEA and the Marines are pretty similar institutions in many respects. 
They are driven by passion and they're very aggressive and they don't take no for an answer. In Guadalajara, Kiki works with a team of special agents, spearheaded by James Kirkendall. I met Kiki Camarino when I first went to Guadalajara. Kiki was about 10 years younger than I am. He was a quiet person who was very devoted to his job, but he was a good husband and father. Originally from Laredo, Texas, Kirkendall began his law enforcement career as a border patrol agent. In 1973, with the creation of the DEA, Kirkendall becomes one of its first agents. Kirkendall was immediately impressed by the young agent's dedication and intelligence. Kiki was a little more enterprising, tried harder, and was a little more successful. And Kiki happened to be the guy out front. Camarina is part of a DEA operation tracking Mexican cartel activity in the area. Four years into his assignment, Camarina gets a tip-off from a Mexican informant working with the DEA about the location of a two and a half thousand acre marijuana plantation in the northern city of Zacatecas. As US agents on foreign soil, the DEA has no authority in Mexico. All agents on the ground can do is pass intelligence to their Mexican counterparts and hope for the best. Acting on Camarina's information, 450 Mexican soldiers backed by helicopters descend on the site. Over 5,000 tons of marijuana are destroyed. $2.5 billion go up in smoke. It's a major triumph for the DEA. But it's a huge hit for Gallardo's cartel. The kingpin is hell-bent on revenge. Someone will be made to pay. Two months later, Agent James Kirkendall is woken up by a call. I got a phone call from Mrs. Camarena. Kiki's wife, Kiki, had not come home the night before. Kiki Camarena was supposed to meet his wife for lunch at a Chinese restaurant. She waited and waited. She thought that something had come up, and, and he was unable to make the, uh, the lunch appointment. But Agent Camarena never made it to lunch or home later that evening. She has not seen her husband since he left for work the day before. She was worried and she called Shaggy and Shaggy called me. If Kiki had stayed out all night, he would have been with us or we would have known him. He was going to be staying out all night. It really it definitely concerned us immediately. We knew that something had to be wrong. Then they started running around, calling people to see if anybody had seen Kiki, and pretty soon they decided nobody had. I then informed the Consul General that we felt we had an agent missing. The next day, a witness comes forward a Mexican employee at the U.S. consulate. The consul general's chauffeur did tell us that he had perhaps seen a law enforcement operation near Kiki's official vehicle. The event he witnessed took place at approximately 2 p.m. while the driver was on his lunch break. He thought he had seen someone being arrested. Days after his friend vanished, Kirkendall learns that the pilot who had informed Camarina about the marijuana plantation 
is also missing. Kirkendall is now sure his agent has been kidnapped by Gallardo in retaliation for the pot bust. There was no reason for us to think that Kiki had any enemies other than the drug traffickers. Since we didn't have any information as to which particular drug trafficker, we were forced to cast a broader net and look for all of them. So the belief was that, that such a bold and brazen event of kidnapping a US federal agent in broad daylight could not have been done without their knowledge and without their, their consent. We had already identified basically the top level ranking members of the cartel. And so that is where we started a global manhunt to bring them to justice. All DEA agents are placed on high alert. Informants are grilled for information about the kidnapping and the homes of known drug traffickers are wiretapped. The massive effort soon pays off. The very next day, at the DEA's Guadalajara office, a crucial telephone conversation is intercepted. We intercepted a radio communication between members of Felix Ayala's group advising that Felix Ayala was headed to the airport to get in his airplane and leave. They were all going to flee because they knew that the full weight of the U.S. government was going to be brought to bear. So there was a phone call that was intercepted from Felix Gallardo that, you know, to his subordinates to bring cash to him. Working with the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, agents raced to Guadalajara Airport to intercept the drug lord. But when they arrive at the airport, there's no sign of Gallardo's jet. What they encountered was a person who identified himself with a fake name. His airplane departure was being guarded by a squad of armed men. The agents can see right away the man isn't Gallardo, but he's clearly someone just as important. His bodyguards raised their weapons. DEA, you know, had their weapons as well. So had one shot been fired, that would have ignited a massacre. When you see somebody in an Elvis costume, you're pretty sure it's an Elvis impersonator. You may not know his name, but you know what he is. It was very clear from what these agents saw that this was a cartel kingpin. There was only one explanation for the flamboyance and the jet. The cartel kingpin is none other than Caro Quintero, co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel. He approaches Comandante Pavon, the head of the Mexican police. He left the scene and made a phone call. We don't know who to. He said he was calling his supervisor, Mexico City. And then he returned, talked to Rafael Caro, and at that point in time, he released him. According to Pavon, Caro Quintero is a top secret informant with the DFS, the Mexican equivalent of the CIA. But the DEA don't buy it. I am positive that he offered a very significant bribe to the Comandante. The Comandante probably talked it over to another senior government official and said, you know, take the bribe and let him go. But where is Felix Gallardo? In retrospect, some today wonder if Felix Gallardo set Rafael Carl Quintero up. He was young, he was stupid, he was arrogant. So if you're a smart guy and you know how investigations work because you've been a cop, then sacrifice your young, stupid partner. At any rate, Rafael Carl Quintero did leave. The cops wouldn't stop him.
27 days after Camarina's abduction, Kirkendall wakes up ready to continue the desperate search when he gets some devastating news. The body of Enrique Camarena was found today. As I was preparing to go to the embassy, I had turned on the television to watch the news, and I saw the, the news story. Someone had leaked the story to the news stations before the DEA. They had been buried, dug up, and dumped along the road. I never lost hope that he was still alive until the bodies were found. Some people said, you know, it couldn't possibly be, but I always thought there was a chance until the bodies were found. Find Camarina there. Earlier that morning, a local farmer had discovered two horribly disfigured corpses. There were signs of torture. And there was a hole in his skull that could not have been made by a bullet. So it had to have been made by a blunt instrument because of the way in which the bone was shattered. The two men had been dead for some time. But the bodies weren't dumped until after Caro Quintero had flown off in an attempt to get the DEA to back off. The news leaves the DEA stunned and reeling. There was a huge letdown among everybody, and emotionally, we were all so upset that, you know, he probably couldn't sleep very well anyway. But by that time, the search is over, so now it's just looking for, looking for the traffickers and, and trying to make sense of it all. Overnight, the search for two missing people becomes a hunt for their brutal killers. In March 1985, Agent Camarina's body arrives back in the USA. I was very hurt. He was a very close friend of mine, but that made me redouble my efforts to do what was necessary to bring his killers under the rule of law. As the agents mourn the loss of their fallen colleague, news comes through of another kidnapping. This time, it's a teenager called Sara Cosio. Sara Cosio and her mother had been riding in a car that was stopped on one of the streets in Guadalajara. Her mother was slapped around, and she was spirited away. The girl's family point the finger at Rafael Caro Quintero, a member of Gallardo's cartel. He's been following her non-stop. Now he's decided to take what he wants. The DEA wiretap the Cosio family's residence with the hope of locating Caro Quintero should Sara call home. A month goes by with no word from Sara. But then in April, a breakthrough. The family received a phone call, and the call came from Costa Rica, from Sara, telling them that she was fine, not to worry about her. The DEA traced the call. It's coming from a large home next to the airport near San Jose. DEA agents in Costa Rica, Sandalillo Gonzalez and his boss, Donald Clements, are tasked with finding the team and hopefully taking down Quintero in the next 24 hours before any more harm comes to the girl. We worked together with the Costa Rican police and we identified a large house where there were supposed to be some Mexican people there. With the assistance of the Costa Rican police, the agents set up surveillance on the house and plan the raid. They have an old faded photo of the drug boss, Caro Quintero. At dawn, the radio call comes in. The operation is a go. When 
when they went in the house, there was no gunfight. There was not much resistance. They found several uh, drug traffickers, low-class Mexican drug traffickers there. But none of the men matched the photo of Caro Quintero. When asked their names, the suspects say Juan, Jose, or Miguel. The one with the most flamboyant name is Marcos Antonio Rios Valenzuela. His passport simply reads, Mark Antony. I remember putting the photo right next to his face, and we both <laughs> looked and said, I don't think so. He was much younger, and, you know, it just didn't look like him. The last hope of identifying Quintero is his captive, Sara Cosio. I spoke Spanish to her, yes. So I asked her, ¿Quién es este hombre? And she replied. She said the whole full name. She said Rafael Caro Quintero. She wanted to make sure there was no mistake. <laughs> Caro Quintero is arrested and flown back to Mexico. After having our agent kidnapped and killed, to have the principal suspect captured was a great achievement. With one of the three cartel leaders behind bars, the DEA are closer to catching the killers of Kiki Camarena. All they need now is for the drug lord to talk. Kirkendall and his colleagues are invited to observe the interrogations of Caro Quintero. The Mexicans use a procedure to torture people, to extract confessions. They force water into the breathing apparatus of a human being to the point that the person can't breathe. After several minutes of water torture, Caro Cantero is ready to talk. And the Mexican police now allow Kirkendall to interrogate the prisoner. He admitted to being a major marijuana cultivator. He admitted that he paid off some Mexican comandantes, but he said he didn't have anything to do with uh, Kiki Camarena's disappearance. Caro Cantero also refuses to place any blame on Gallardo. Instead, he points the finger at the third suspect, fellow Mexican drug dealer Ernesto Fonseca. Kirkendall knows the only way they will ever get the truth is if they can hunt down and capture both Felix Gallardo and Fonseca. But they have a mountain to climb. The cartel kingpin is untouchable. He's bribed virtually everyone who matters in Mexico. The fastest way to find these two cartel leaders is to tap all the phones of their associates. But officials refuse to execute the order for the phone tapping. Worse still, the American government is reluctant to rock the boat. I got a call from a source high up in DEA who said something is wrong. The Mexican government at the highest level is not helping look for our agent. We hoped to get the White House involved and there were squabbles going on within the United States government about how hard to push Mexico to look for the missing man. Without the full support of the Mexican government, the DEA can only keep close tabs on the two cartel leaders and hope they make a mistake. Oh oh Puerto Vallarta. Every Easter, tourists come here for sun, sea, and sand. 
but very recently the crime rate has skyrocketed. In late 1984 and early 1985, there had been several assaults on foreign tourists, especially women. And so to protect the tourist industry, the Mexican government had sent a militarized police team to Puerto Vallarta to try to calm down some of the violent crime. One night, a group of men start a violent bar fight. And the police chase them. The police track the men to a mansion. But within moments, weapons appear at the windows. The local police don't feel like they can handle the situation, so they contact this SWAT team. Soon outmanned and outgunned by the SWAT team, the armed men give themselves up. Inside, they find an arsenal of automatic weapons, remote control explosives, and grenade launchers. They also discover a box of audio cassettes. When the arrested men are identified, the police are stunned to discover that among them is one of the cartel leaders wanted in the murder of Kiki Camarina, Ernesto Fonseca. Fonseca is taken to prison to be interrogated. The DEA hope that he'll point the finger at Felix Gallardo. But Fonseca pins the blame squarely on Carol Quintero. Suspect in the Camarina case. Fonseca is sent to Almoya prison on charges of drug trafficking, kidnapping, and murder. Ernesto Fonseca. They are already in prison in Mexico. The agents get one huge lead from this mass takedown. One of the men arrested in Puerto Vallarta with Fonseca says he knows exactly where Agent Camarina was tortured and killed. Kirk and Dahl and several DEA agents race to the address. 881 Lope de Vega, in a middle-class neighborhood in Guadalajara. They hope to retrieve any evidence that will help them nail all three men for Camarina's murder. The house belongs to Caro Quintero. The kitchen was a mess. There was food and dishes stacked on every cabinet, every counter. But other than that, it was just a pretty common upper class home for Guadalajara. If this is where Camarina was murdered, Kirkendall's men find no obvious clues. By the time DEA got into it, walls had been washed, everything had been scrubbed. Most traces of a murder were gone, but not all. They took wall samples and paint samples and vacuumed up everything you could possibly think of. A window sash cord looks identical to the ropes that were used to bind the two men. Then hairs are discovered on a rug. They're rushed off to labs in Washington for analysis. The forensic specialists soon get the results. They match Enrique Camarina's hair. It's physical proof that the agent was held in this house by members of the cartel. With two of the cartel's leaders already locked up, the DEA's sole focus now is catching the one still at large. Felix Gallardo. And Kirkendall has an ace 
up his sleeve. The audio cassettes found at the house in Puerto Vallarta. Kirkendall has a hunch that they may contain a missing piece of the jigsaw that will lead straight to Gallardo. As the tape plays, he hears shouting and beating. Then with horror, he hears a voice he recognizes only too well. That of his friend, Kiki Camarino, being interrogated and worse. The tapes were eventually provided to the Drug Enforcement Administration. People like myself would then listen to the tapes from time uh, at length and see what they could make of them. And the tapes revealed the motive behind the abduction. <laughs> He's being mistreated. He's being tortured. Gracias, gracias. Is asked who the informants were that provided some of the information. And they're using the water torture. <coughs> there are more than one interrogator, <laughs> several points. At one point, he says, Don't murder me. My children need me. He is begging for mercy. <laughs> and he wasn't afforded any mercy. A doctor was on hand to keep Camarina alive long enough to answer questions. The revelations are as shocking as they are sickening. According to witnesses and testimony from defendants, Caro Quintero came to the residence and he was a heavy coke user. So he was very high on coke and struck him. And later, Ernesto Fonseca, another member of the cartel, came there and saw that Kiki Camarena was in the throes of death, and he slapped Caro Quintero, and in Spanish he said, this is your baby, now you live with it, and he departed the residence. Harrowing as they are, the audio tapes finally reveal why it's been impossible to take down Gallardo. During the interrogation, Camarina refers to one of his interrogators by his title. Comandante. The commandant of the Mexican police official that was conducting the interrogation, it was pretty clear that that, that was a Mexican police official and a senior police official at that. And then it's further clear from the tapes that there is government corruption at very high levels in relation to the members of the Guadalajara cartel. For years, the DEA had their suspicions that local law enforcement was in the pay of the cartel leaders. Now at last, they have proof. Felix Gallardo was able to evade capture because he had a lot of very high-ranking, very important politicians, government officials, that he paid for protection. To get to Gallardo, the DEA must find one incorruptible officer and bring Miguel Felix Gallardo to justice at last. For eight months, Camarina's old boss and friend, James Kirkendall, has overseen the hunt for Gallardo. But now his time on the case is over. A change needed to be made. They needed to move me. I probably wasn't happy about it, but it was time for me to go. I was not, uh, I was not effective anymore. In October 1985, he is replaced by Ed Heath as Guadalajara's DEA supervisor, and the hunt for Gallardo 
continues. So far, the drug kingpin has evaded capture by bribing officials and politicians. And his many ranches, hotels, and real estate double up as hideouts. And so he was able to move from location to location to location, didn't spend a lot of time at any given house. So he had a massive security blanket, and it was very difficult to penetrate it. Tracking Gallardo should be a simple matter of tapping the phones of his associates. But official corruption has made that impossible. The US has now raised the stakes in the hunt for Gallardo. Mexico owes the US billions in debt, money that US officials are willing to cancel if they can capture Gallardo. So in 1989, Mexican officials throw their full support behind the DEA effort to take the ruthless criminal down. To help with the operation, the Deputy Attorney General of Mexico calls one of the top commanders on the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, Comandante Guillermo Gonzalez Calderoni. When the Mexican government wanted to arrest a major capo or drug trafficking boss, they would go to Gonzalez Calderoni. He was probably the most feared commandantes in Mexico. Drug traffickers absolutely feared him. With the Mexican government now fully on board and Calderoni in charge, the DEA get what they've been asking for all along a widespread tapping of the phones of all of Gallardo's known associates. They soon identify Felix Gallardo's codename, Numero Uno. After two and a half months, Gallardo's calls are traced to a house near Culiacan, a city in the northwestern state of Sinaloa. Calderoni and his men rent an apartment in Sinaloa to spy on the house. After days of surveillance, they spot their prey at last. They saw him when they delivered some ice chests with shrimp and lobster and what have you, and that's when he knew that he was in the residence. On Calderoni's order, his team of 14 men approaches the house. They take Gallardo completely by surprise, still in his pajamas. Gonzalez Calderoni put an AK-47 uh, barrel into his mouth and told him, look, you know, you're under arrest. And Felix Gallardo said, look, you know, he says, I'll, I'll pay you $7 million if you release me. And he said, no, he said, I can't do that. And then he says, well, then you're a dead man. That same day, a Mexican army squadron moves in against scores of state and municipal police officers in the northwestern city of Culiacan, Gallardo's hometown. It's the boldest strike the Mexican government has ever launched against drug trafficking and corruption. Gallardo is taken into custody, along with the entire police force of Culiacan. The manhunt for the Guadalajara cartel is a turning point in the DEA's history. It made DEA more renowned. 
the number of agents grew, its mission was better defined, it gained respect because of the effort that went into finding the abductors of one of its agents. That triumph came thanks to the courage and sacrifice of Agent Kiki Camarena. He was a good husband, a good father, a great investigator, a fine friend, you know. He didn't have feet of clay, he was real. Somebody to emulate, somebody to look up to. He was a true American hero, he was a good man. Yeah, I'm glad to have known him. It was, a, it was an honor. <laughs>